Welcome back, Pet Parent. I have a guest today that has been on my list to bring to you for so very long. And I finally got to meet her in person and asked her to come on the podcast. And I am so excited that she said yes, because she does so many different things. And I'm going to do my best to touch on everything so that you get as much information as possible from her. But I, I'm i just so excited. So I can't wait anymore. Chelsea Kent, thank you so much for being here. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for having me. <laughs> so you do so many things. Um, you have a store. You have Solutions Pet Products. You have Parsley Pet. What? I, I know you have like your own apothecary. What you do so much? What? Tell me a little bit about what you do and how you got involved in the pet industry. Mm -hmm. Um, the way that I got involved in the pet industry was kind of a combination of things. I was actually doing acting and modeling of all things, um, and then moved back to my home state of Colorado and my sister was moving out of the state when I was moving into the state and I just took over the job that she had, which was in a pet supply store. And it happened to coincide with me dealing with some of my own health problems that I was not getting any support really from the doctors. Like their answers to everything were things that I was like, you get paid to give people these answers. <laughs> this is ridiculous. So I just realized that I had to be my own advocate. And working in a pet supply store at the same time as that occurring made it so that every person that was coming in was asking questions where I was like, I don't know, let me go research it. And I was already on this research mission to help myself. So I just ended up spending all of my time doing research for myself as well as for all of the different people that were asking questions and just collectively over the years you managed to gain a lot of knowledge um i decided you know a few years in like you can have a job but it's not the same as a career so it was like either i need to find something else to do or make this into a career and long story short my mom and i partnered to create heroes pets which obviously then became a career but then um a number of years into that, I started feeling a little burned out and just like I was spending all of my time doing the same thing over and over and over again. So the only way for me to really stay in the industry was to start doing things out of the box of retail. So I started going to regulatory events, so going to the AFCO meetings and getting involved in advocacy um, in doing that. I managed to partner up with some other pretty well-known people in the industry to do a variety of different projects. Um, that was really educational and taught me a lot about laboratory analysis and the importance of data and data analysis. So I had helped the people that started Parsley Pet to kind of get started. And there was a point at which the person that was running the company was busy doing some other things and wasn't um, putting too much effort into the company. And I just was like, hey, if you ever want to sell, <laughs> I would be interested, especially if you still have all of your data from like all of the previous tests. So um, Angela Robertson and I purchased Parsley Pet and then kind of got I got checkmated into starting solutions about a month later, so that wasn't really intentional, but it, because of my role in advocacy, it was really important to me to not allow the people that were about to get pushed out of the industry to really leave the industry, and there wasn't a whole lot of other option to keep them around. So it was like, well, I guess this is the thing I'm doing now too. <laughs> so it does seem like a lot of different things, but to me, it's all one thing. It's just different avenues of the same thing. I can totally see that. Um, and I got to meet you at the last AFCO meeting, which happened to have been the first AFCO meeting I ever attended. And who the heck knows might be the last one. <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> but we'll yeah. see. We'll see what happens there. But um, advocacy is something that I have recently, like, 
I don't want to say discovered. I've been an animal advocate. I've worked in rescue for many, many, many years. Or I, I should say I did because at the moment I, I don't have the bandwidth. But it's a different level of advocacy that I have found. Like it really pulls at me. And it's not easy at all. Um, and you can talk to that so much better than I can. But I do want to talk about solutions. And I do want to talk about Parsley Pet. But since 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 we brought it up, um, can you just so people I, I have told people like my experience at AFCO, but would you mind just summarizing your experience at AFCO? <laughs> you know, what I usually say about it is that it's like a really, 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 really boring horror movie where it's like you're you're about to fall asleep because it's so boring and then something happens that you're just like oh my gosh my brain just exploded are you kidding me that that just happened so you have these moments of horror which it seems like that's almost always what it is is stuff that's going on in the industry behind the scenes um perspectives on the way that certain things sh that like how they should be handled and those things really don't align with consumer interests or and they don't align with your experience of owning a pet if you want your pet in your home like if it's a backyard pet maybe possibly you might be like ah, okay but if you have a pet that is a companion then pretty much everything that goes on in regulation opposes what decisions you would make for yourself for your pet and so those are the kinds of horrors that you see is just these people acting like it's totally normal <laughs> to make these decisions about things that are just absolutely mortifying like how do we use not food waste but industry waste like chemical trash to feed animals and how do we make it so that it's nearly impossible to do alternative things like stuff like that so you're like bored 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 why would you do that bored 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 <laughs> you know that that's such an interesting um perspective that i absolutely don't disagree with but it was that was one of the takeaways i had was like just how casually all of these people were just like and this is what we're gonna do and Mm -hmm. um, let's go ahead and vote on it. And yay, yay, yay. And I'm like, wait, what? Like, <laughs> How are we mm -hmm. so like gung ho and casual and like no big deal about what on, you know, in black and white in the like, um, paperwork that they give you, it's like, did you read the same thing I read? <laughs> Cause I would not be okay with this. Yeah. Um, yeah. At the one that you attended, there was discussion about spent grains and they were, pretty proud about their use of spent grains. And that's something where like after a bunch of chemicals and toxins have accumulated into this byproduct, then that goes to animal feed. And yeah, why why are they like, yeah, we're gonna use these. Woohoo. <laughs> you're like, that's that's not yeah. something that I would even dig out of my trash can to give to my animal. Why are we excited about that? I mean it really comes down to you know, the, their thinking is more, are we going to pay money to go and do something with this, like to figure out a way to get rid of it? Or are we going to receive money by selling it for this cause? And that, in my opinion, is just not a good reason to be making those choices. Yeah. So that, I'll use that as a segue into doing things the right way with solutions pet products. So I, there's probably some things that can and can't be talked about as far as like the trajectory of what, what got you there. Um, but there are definitely uh, products on the market. And this was actually something Susan Thixton said to me one day. And I, I was like, like, I kind of knew that in the back of my mind, but the way she said it, I was like, oh my gosh, yes, you're right. She said that um, even not not all raw foods even are are great for your pet. Like, there are some mm -hmm. raw food companies out there that are playing the AFCO game too. And I was like, I guess I knew that, but it, it, it never really hit me. So, like, 
-hmm. one of the things that I know that you're doing with solutions is doing everything the way that you would want to feed your dog or cat. Mm -hmm. And that is vastly different from regulatory, from industry. Can you tell me a little bit about that and how you're creating the products at Solutions? Yeah. I mean, it's definitely a lot easier to do things the wrong way. (laughs) So um, by saying doing things the right way, it equates to saying doing things the hard way. And it just requires a lot of creativity, um, a lot of networking with people that honestly are not really in the pet industry very much. So working directly with the farmers and getting to know them rather than just having brokers for things where you don't necessarily even know where it's coming from or care. In a lot of cases, the companies are like, I just need this ingredient. I don't care where it comes from. Um, I always joke that one way that I visualize kibble companies or canned food companies actually creating an ingredient panel is there's like dice and there's a set of say maybe 20 dice and each one of them on the different sides it has the ingredients that are available so what junk (laughs) is available from the bio bio biodiesel industry and the alcohol production industry and the food waste industry and you know on and on and on and you just take the dice and you throw them on the table in whatever order they land in that's your ingredient panel so they're all pretty much identical products they're just in a different order so for a company like solutions you know we we don't use the dice So we don't have a preset list of things that are available. We're not saying, what are the easiest brokers to buy from? We're saying, okay, we want this ingredient. We have to go find it. And then when we find it, we have to audit those companies to determine whether or not we want to work with them. And if there's something that we don't like about their their processing or whatever thing they're doing, you know, the way they're raising the animals or one little chemical that we just don't want in there, then we have to go through the whole process of either negotiating that they do things differently or determining that we have to start all over again and we have to go find somebody else that's more in alignment with what we're doing. And we have to do that with every single ingredient and not just one time. I mean, you have to understand, of course, as we all know, but sometimes we don't want to admit to ourselves that things change. So sometimes you have something that's going really well and something changes and you have to either accept the change or modify what you're doing to stay in alignment with your values. So that does make it a lot harder but that's what we choose to continue to do. One of the things that I've learned in the past couple of years that was surprising to me, though I think a lot of things are like, I don't I don't think anything surprises most of us anymore. We're just like, oh yeah, I believe that, <laughs> right? right. <laughs> um, but one of the things, like when I first realized that it isn't as simple as like taking an, in- an ingredient that you and I know that, you know, we can go to the grocery store and buy like a particular mushroom. If it's not listed as an ingredient in the database for at at the time, AFCO, you know, then you can't put it in your pet food. Like it's Mm -hmm. food, it's real food. It's not like, you know, you're making something in a lab and you have to apply for a patent for, you know, it's not, it's like, it's just a piece of food, but they're like, no, no, that can't, you can't put that in pet, pet food because we don't know what it is. Mm-hmm. That was crazy. Well, there's, there's no studies on its safety, even though it's used in 59,000 different supplements for pets and has been for the last 40 years. So, yeah, you're right. Like in the AFCO book, you can legally use feces, litter, hydrolyzed hair, hydrolyzed feathers, sludge. Um, fish oil can be from oil extracted from fish or it can be from cannery waste and there's no definition for cannery waste like is it even a fish cannery like it doesn't say (laughs) so you can use all of those things but you can't use catnip you can't use milk thistle you can use spirulina only in small amounts and only for coloring you are not allowed to use it for nutritional value so things like that yeah it's it's really complicated and 
in a lot of cases, it's it's disheartening and frustrating because you see these companies that are using things that are legally registered by the EPA as chemicals, and that's a primary ingredient, often in even things like prescription foods. Like, it's not just food. They're giving it to the sickest pets, and that's totally acceptable. And then you have to jump through hoops for six months to be able to say fermented okra. Like, we had to write white papers. <laughs> it's ridiculous. So, that the idea of using fermented okra is, is very different. Um, and that kind of brings me to my next question about how you feel Solutions Pet Products is, is different, not just in the pet food space, but even in the, what I call the healthy pet food space. Mm-hmm. Well, there's a lot to say there. Um, one of the basic fun facts about Solutions is actually the way that the company started. You know, it started with our entire base team going through a ridiculous legal situation and being prohibited from doing the things that they had created in the pet food industry. And so before Solutions was actually even an idea, I looked at the things that they were prohibited from doing, and I thought, if you guys aren't allowed to do these things, then what could you do? And I created a list of things that literally don't exist in the market based off of that list. It was like, okay, nobody has eggnog. We could easily make eggnog. Nobody has a Nepalese recipe of butter tea. So we could do that. So I created a list of about 30 different things and I gave it to that group of people. And I said, okay, here are all the things you guys could make based on the restrictions that you have. And in response, they were like, no, we're lightning bolts. You do it. <laughs> and I was like, I don't want to do it. <laughs> so realistically, the foundation of the company revolved around creating things that didn't really exist in the industry. So then taking it a step beyond that, um, you know, there's there are a lot of things that we we assume to be true. We believe to be true about health in humans and in pets. There are things that seem logical that they would be true, but we don't have evidence of those things. And that's, the, you know, side note, that's actually why I wanted Parsley Pet was because I wanted to see the direct impact of food and the influence of different types of food on the body itself. So testing a body tissue is the only way to do that. So that kind of information is not readily available. It's really difficult to find. It can be difficult to interpret. It takes a massive amount of research. But being able to have that kind of data and the science that we spend a lot of time procuring and reading through and assessing, you know, those kinds of things are really how we determine the recommendations that we make, you know, we're looking deep down at like, what's the metabolic data that's available? What, what is actually true versus what is marketed as true that maybe isn't. And that is our focus is what's the reality, not the assumption. I do you want to talk more about Parsley Pet, but really quickly before we do, I had one more question about solutions. Um, this is always a hot topic on this podcast i am i mean i kind of understand why because for me i can see both sides but uh i know that you you advocate for a very minimally processed food um and that you do fermentation and um recently came out with an article that you know, this is why we don't do HPP and why we'll never do HPP. And I, I know you've done a ton more research on it than I do. I sat through the presentation at AFCO a couple of months ago. And there were a lot, like just for me, just for somebody who I don't make a pet food, I feed pet food, but I don't make a pet food. Um, I do try to educate myself as much as I can and, and then try to educate others. I can see where like, I can see both sides and my, my brain was like going crazy at all the things that this, you know, the, the, the presenter was telling us. And I'm like, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. 
oh my gosh. (laughs) Um, But I can also see where using a process like HPP, though we might not want to use it for, you might not want to use it for solutions where another pet food, it can, it, it can be kind of leverage to bring people into the market away from other foods, but I want you to talk about it. I've talked about it enough, but people <laughs> love to hear about it. Sure. Well, I'll start by saying something that I say very often, which is the only sweeping statement that is always true is that no sweeping statement is ever always true. So, of course, what that means is there are there are times, there are incidents where something like HPP could potentially be valuable, and then there are times that it isn't. So what are those times, right? Let's kind of try to find what's the dividing line there. And a lot of this is actually what was presented at that specific meeting, as well as a one that followed up shortly after that, the IAFP meeting, and these points and more are referenced in that document on the solutions blog page. So HPP does not work on high fat foods. So that's one reason why even if solutions was like, yeah, let's do HPP, it would not be valuable for us to do it. If you're feeding any brand of food that's high fat, it's ineffective. The fat actually protects the microbes and that prevents them from being killed or neutralized in the process of doing high pressure pasteurization. Um, it also doesn't work on low moisture foods. So if you have a freeze dried, dehydrated, air dried, any of those things, it wouldn't work as the last step. They could do HPP on it while it's still wet, but this brings it to another time in which it doesn't work. It's not very effective if there's a long transit time, more than basically like a day, before HPP or after HPP. Because even though you have done, you've damaged the pathogens, they actually can recover. So if you have a longer transit time before or afterwards, then even if it was effective immediately after, that's not when you're feeding it. You're not like, I just pulled this out of the machine and now I'm giving it to my pet. Those pathogens could have recovered. And especially, like, even if those pathogens didn't recover, if you didn't HPP in the end package, the final one that goes to the consumer, you can recontaminate the product after you open it. So to do HPP, most companies will do big logs of their meat product. And then after the HPP, they open that package up which again, can open it up to contamination and then they mix it and then they form it into whatever shape they're gonna be selling it in. And then if you're drying it, that's a whole nother set of time and potential contamination for that product. So it's really not valuable to do it even if it were a higher moisture product at the time that the HPP was done. And even if it were a lower fat product where it would be effective. So when would HPP be valuable? If you have a product that is already contaminated, it's not a really high quality sourcing, then it is going to reduce the pathogen load in there. But as they said in that meeting, it is absolutely not a sterilization method. It is pasteurization, not sterilization. So it's not 100% effective. My biggest beef with HPP is actually not even necessarily all of that because I don't think that pathogens are even always bad. Our bodies, bodies in general, have worked symbiotically with good bacteria and bad bacteria through all of the time that life has existed. So there's actually more and more research proving benefit to having certain pathogens in the body. So we don't have to be scared of them all the time. Even FDA referenced scientific studies show that you can intentionally feed dogs salmonella, pathogenic salmonella, and it's almost guaranteed that they will not get sick if you meant to give it to them in higher doses. So I'm not really against the pathogen so much. What I worry about is the plastic. It's not possible to do HPP in really any kind of container besides plastic. It has to be high flex plastic, which means it has higher levels of instable 
for simplifying terms, um, plastic particles. So it's very easy to destroy them. So it's, it's kind of the equivalent of if you leave your water bottle, your plastic water bottle in your car and it's 120 degrees out and it's sitting in your car, who knows how hot it's getting. Everybody knows you're not supposed to drink out of that water bottle, but it's even more than that. Like the pressure that no life can live above is 300 MPA, and they do it at 600 MPA. So it's a massive amount of pressure that's placed on this highly unstable plastic, and that does get pushed into the food matrix. So because we know there's massive amounts of data that really show the damage on the endocrine system and the hormone balance, and we see it regularly with Parsley Pet, that I think regular use of something that we know is contaminated with plastic particles is really the most concerning thing about it, in my opinion. That is more and more concerning. I know this is a little off topic, but we, I have been inundated with videos on Instagram and TikTok of all the people who were recently at the congressional hearing on um, you know food safety in our country. And this is about you know, human food mm -hmm. and pet food in general is so much worse. But yep. <laughs> I mean, what our government allows, even in human food, is just so, it's almost like it's intentional. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to, I don't want to be the one saying that it's intentional, but I feel like it <laughs> may be intentional. Um, and then even with that intention that I believe is there, I, the byproduct of that is what our pets get, which is mm -hmm. even worse. Um, so Parsley Pet, you, you brought that up again. I am such a big fan and I'm not afraid to say that. Like uh, there are so many different tests on the market for different things that we can do with our pets. Um, at home testing has become like a really, like it's, it's, it's booming right now. There are more and more that are coming out and I like a handful of them for various reasons, but I recently started incorporating um, parsley pet test with my one-on-one -on -one clients and the ones that decide to do it. Um, Cause I, I try to work with people where they're at, you know, with what they can afford to do. And, you know, sometimes if they can't afford the testing, then we can, you know, I want to, I want to put the money where it's going to benefit the pet most when they're a little strapped, especially in this economy, but still with w the information you're getting, I feel like it's still a, an incredible value. This is something you, you're not going to get from your veterinarian mm -hmm. even. Um, they can run a ton of different tests at different labs and different universities and you're still not going to get the information that you're going to get from parsley pet especially with the kind of personal touches that you guys have on it can you tell me a mm -hmm. little bit about it's a hair tissue mineral analysis can you tell me a little bit about that how it works and the and the information that you're getting from it mm -hmm. so it's a hair test that's done at home you don't have to receive a kit or anything once you pay for it then uh, you get instructions on how to cut the sample, how much you need, where to mail it, and then you get a link to an intake form. The intake form provides enough information to make it easier to personalize the results. So say, for example, we get results back and it says that your pet is really high in zinc. Now, that could be a number of different things, but if you put in your intake form that you're giving zinc, easy fix, stop doing that, <laughs> right? So um, it's really just designed to try to cater more directly to what things you're doing and what you should consider or even what you should discuss with your vet. So everything is really done digitally after you mail the sample in. The information that you're getting is uptake of uh, minerals, heavy metals, and hormones over the course of time that it took to grow the sample. So that depends on the length of the sample that you send in. If it's, you know, an inch, inch and a half, then it's a few months. 
Um, if you were to send in like my hair, <laughs> you could get several years worth. That's not really valuable because you are diluting the information. You would get an average of all of those years of information. So if you wanted and you had a long enough hair sample, and I've done this before, you could send in the tip and then you could send in the side at the root separately so that you're able to compare this was my health then and this is my health now. On that note, I'll clarify, we do humans, horses, and canines. Um, the one thing, just going back to what you were saying about the value of it, one thing that I really appreciate about this type of testing is that if you don't have a large budget, it can actually help you to save money. So it's it's $250 for dogs. Normally, there's coupon codes somewhere out in the ether, <laughs> but... <laughs> Let's say that you have a pet where you're like, okay, I could potentially need to do a thyroid test for T4, reverse T3, T3, TSH. I also need ACTH and cortisol for the adrenals. I need parathyroid hormone. I need vitamin D testing. I need B vitamin testing. I need a CBC, a CMP. Like, the list can be so long of the information that you want to gather for your pet that it is not affordable. So when you take a test like Parsley Pet, it helps to refine and like direct what you need. So we can say there's no indications in this report that would say that you need to do a vitamin D test, or there are indications in this report that show that you probably should be looking more closely at the thyroid or the adrenals or um, inflammation or cancer, or like, here's reasons why we believe that allergies are occurring in your pet. So it just really helps to like refine what other things that you should do. And in most cases, we will make recommendations about specific things that are beneficial in tandem because usually HTMA is most valuable in tandem with other tests. So what you gain from that is you actually get to see where the error in metabolism lies. So for example, um, we find that not all, but the majority of pets with blood anemia actually have very, very, very high tissue iron, not low. So it's not true anemia in the sense of a full iron deficiency. What's happening is that the body is using the iron incorrectly. It's not converting it from non-hemi iron to hemi iron. So what you need to focus on is not necessarily iron supplementation because in the tissues it's too high. You need to focus on iron conversion, which is going to require methylation, B vitamins, and vitamin C instead. So the way that you're addressing an issue can be different based off of those results as well, and especially when you're seeing them in tan. So, well, you've mentioned a couple of things already, but um, what are some of the cooler things or the more interesting things that you've noticed with all of the data that you now have through mm -hmm. Parsley Pet? There's so many things. I could stay on here for hours. So um, I would say calcium is probably one of the most interesting. Um, calcium is not that valuable to see in blood tests because it's very tightly regulated by the body and the body stores 1.6 million times more calcium in tissue than blood. So you won't actually see imbalances in blood calcium until the body's in severe crisis. Mm -hmm. But... Calcium imbalances can actually be the cause of everything from like fatty lipomas to sebaceous cysts, tremors, seizures, allergies, um, you know, retention of other minerals. It can be indicative of heavy metal toxicity, vitamin D deficiency. All the hormones are dependent on proper calcium levels and vice versa. <laughs> so I think being able to identify what's going on with calcium, if you got literally no other information off of those tests besides tissue calcium, it would still be worth $250 because of the degree of influence that calcium has on the body. Um, 
I was really surprised to find out that low sodium can cause muscle wasting. You have to mm -hmm. have enough salt for the body to properly utilize protein. So even with adequate protein intake, you still will have relative protein deficiency if sodium is deficient. Um, the influence of the hormones, I think, is so understated. So uh, even if, let's say that you have adequate thyroid function and adequate adrenal function. So from a veterinary perspective and blood tests, you're like, they're in range. Everything is good to go. That's not a contributing variable. We have found that that's absolutely inaccurate. And the reason is because the imbalance in the ratio between the two can still make the body respond as if there's a deficiency or toxicity of one of those hormones. So you can still, for example, manifest the symptoms of Addison's disease, even if Addison's isn't present, but adrenal hormone uptake is very low and thyroid hormone uptake is high. So you can still resolve health problems associated with those things just by helping to support the hormone balance. Um, and then I think the other thing that's most interesting to me is lithium. Uh, lithium is really something that we need to do more research on. <laughs> so lithium is, it impairs thyroid function in multiple different ways. We don't want high lithium in the body. And the sweeping statement has always been just avoid high lithium or supplement with thyroid. But what we've actually found is that pets that are not fixed naturally have higher lithium in their tissues. So why would that be when they actually have a better metabolism than the ones that are fixed? And what I think is true is that the sex hormones help to store lithium in the tissues as a protective mechanism for the thyroid. So I think that castration might actually be releasing lithium into the blood and impairing thyroid function. And I think that the way that the body stores lithium might have an enormous influence on metabolism in general. So I'm hoping somebody hears that someday and is like, I want to do a research study and then they come and get all my data. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I mean, coming from the rescue world 20, 20 years ago, I started working in rescue. It That was one of the harder things for me to... I don't want to say it was hard for me to accept the information, but like, I didn't want to hear it to begin with because, you know, humans are humans. And, uh, there are so many of us who are very irresponsible. And, um, I, I actually today no longer believe that we have quote unquote, too many dogs and cats. I think it's, um, just, more of a distribution issue and you know that some mm -hmm. people are not as responsible as others but learning especially in the past couple of years how detrimental it is to their health especially when we are spaying and neutering them so young mm -hmm. um, they don't even have the opportunity to you know fully mature bef more often than not before they're spayed or neutered and um so many veterinarians were not trained in alternative spay and neuter procedures, um, doing, you know, the ovary sparing spays and the, mm -hmm. like, the, there's, there's so much out there that we can do. And yes, we want to be responsible um, so that we're not putting animals into the world that are going to suffer, but also we need to be responsible for the health of the animals that we are caring for. And so it's like this, like mm -hmm. teeter totter. <laughs> yeah. What do we do? Yeah. Well, we, we should look to Europe a little bit more because they don't really do a whole lot of castration there. And if you ever go over there, like they will walk around with their dogs, they're not on leash and you can see visibly that they are not fixed and they're well behaved. They're not running off. They're not picking fights. Like, they do a pretty good job of having good quality pets in a responsible environment and they don't have the overpopulation problems. They don't have the health problems. Like it, it is very different. And we do have multiple places really in the world that we can actually look to 
provide us evidence of that. Yeah, it is interesting to see. You know, I think so many Americans are not well-traveled, and I can't claim to be either. I've only been out of the country a handful of times. But, I mean, even... I think that's one of the one of the benefits of the internet and social media specifically is that we can get a glimpse at what's happening around the world and not just here. Um, and and I get it, like you know, being an American, we have fifty states that we can travel to, and they're all very different and have very different cultural, um, you know, and food experiences and all this. So it's like for so many Americans, it's like, why would we leave? But to see how the rest of the world does things, it's like, oh, we're we're really mm-hmm. not doing things right here, yeah. for sure. Um, but it, I, I want to kind of circle back around a little bit to solutions, because you're not just doing a food, which I think is um, one of the main things we like to talk about is the food because it is the foundation of health. Like what we put into the body is fueling our cells and it's literally, you know, constructing our bodies um, with, you know, how quickly our cells divide and die off and all the things. But you do other things with solutions as well. Um, you mentioned all the different like milk products that you have, but you also have a lot of herbal products. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about, uh, you know, why and how you're doing those? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So um, with the herbs, I think right now we have 15 herbal powder blends and then we have three tinctures. So the tinctures are a new addition. Um, One of those is a duplicate of the powder, the parasite free, just because Anything for parasites is very bitter, so there's two ways that you can give that now, but everything else is fully different um, ingredient panels. So the history behind those is actually uh, my my apothecary here <laughs> that I'm in. It's very big, lots and lots of herbs. Uh, I've been actually making the herbal blends for, I guess, about 13 years uh, just in my basement and just for my retail store. And I transferred a portion, actually a kind of a small portion of the things that I've been making over to solutions just to make sure that all of the farmers had something that they could get paid to do. Uh, so we've been really impressed with how well they've sold. We weren't fully expecting that, but it's awesome. Uh, the history of the reason that I got into that in the first place, it's not actually something that I was like, oh, I just want to start making herbs. It was really out of necessity. So my uh, supplement section in my retail store is maybe 25 to 30 feet long and as high as you can comfortably reach. So we have a lot of supplements I am very meticulous about not having things that uh, duplicate each other. Like, I I don't want to have things that are really redundant. So uh, we'll usually, if there's something new that's amazing, it has to be better than whatever we have that's similar for us to bring it in. So that size of supplement shelf without redundancy. And I still was finding that being that we we don't really advertise. We primarily have people that come in by referral. And so they had very complicated issues and that's still how it is. But I was finding that they would come in and they would say, okay, I have this health problem. And I was like, okay, you need these 10 supplements to manage the situation that you're dealing with. And either they wouldn't buy them all, they would take one, in which case they wouldn't have a good outcome, but that's what they could afford. Yeah. Or if they did buy them all, they wouldn't use them all because it was too much. It was too complicated. So poor compliance still resulted in bad outcomes. So it, it for me, it really was like, okay, how can I make it so that there's fewer things that they have to use with less filler that they don't need that makes it more easy to use and more affordable for them to be able to purchase it? Like at most... I want them to buy three supplements, preferably two, preferably one, if that's an option at all. So really 
the only reason that I made them was to fill holes in those shelves where there just wasn't something that was available, where we had all of those needs met, where it was just consolidated, easy to use, super effective. Um, you know, the for the most part, the things that we have where you would have to get one more supplement is like, if your pet has a heart problem, then we have the I heart you, but you should also use the jiggles because they're two very different things. Like one is helping the heart to do its job of moving blood. And the other one, the jiggles is for helping the heart structurally. And then maybe you might add in like a CoQ10 or Ubiquinol, which we're not going to add into a powder because that is a liquid. So like there's very few areas where we have recommendations for additional supplements added in. And that's why. That's amazing. And I think um, herbs are underutilized and underrated. And it's it's actually one of my next next things that I, I, I want to learn about um, is, is uh, herbalism, because I think there's so much benefit there. And I am one of those people that's like, I want to make an apothecary. <laughs> like, that's what I want <laughs> to do. Um, it, it is a goal of mine. But I, you know, we've covered a lot and I'm sure there's, there's, so, there's always so much more to talk about, but I always like to like, the first time I have somebody on, I want to kind of introduce them and their products and, and services. But um, before I let you go, I do want to just kind of ask, we've touched on so many things already from AFCO to feeding pet, you know, the food we're feeding to HPP and HTMA test, but if in having a store, you 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 may already have your like pitch down. I don't know, but if there's one piece of advice um, that you could give pet parents who are maybe just starting out, like they've been kibble feeders forever and they're like just starting to to learn that like oh this actually isn't good for my dog and they're faced with like overwhelm of all of this information and a lot of bad information out there too by the way um what would you what would you say to somebody who's like just starting out um i would say that the two things that are probably the most important um one always try to stick with things that nature provides so even if humans take a product, like they, they create a product that has 15 different ingredients that are made by nature, it's still not anything man-made. We more and more and more and more are finding that man-made things can be problematic. There's so much that we don't know, and there's so much that we might never know, <laughs> and nature knows. Nature does not do a good job of making mistakes. Nature doesn't cause the same kinds of contaminations and, you know, issues that humans do. And where that has been wrong in the past, we've been making mass produce things long enough that we do have a good idea of how to avoid those things. Like the ancient Romans used to flavor their wine with lead. We know we shouldn't do that anymore, right? Like lead is natural. Let's not do that. So <laughs> outside of that, like whole food things are always going to be better. Um, if you can read on the label that it says, like, for example, um, you know, zinc sulfate or copper protonate or something where you're actually reading a vitamin or a mineral or an amino acid, man made that. It's an isolate. Try to avoid those things. The other thing that I would say is, in my opinion, you're going to do a lot better for yourself if you are looking at how much it costs to use a product and not how much it costs to buy a product. Because across the board, the things are going to be less expensive for you to use it if it's a healthier thing with fewer fillers and like junk in there. So better concentration, which might be for food, a higher concentration of calories. <clears throat> so for example, solutions, uh, we recommend using our food based on 88 calories an ounce the average raw food is 40 calories an ounce, with some of them I've seen as low as 27. So our sticker price can be higher and it can still be less expensive to use. 
That also applies to supplements. You can have a very inexpensive supplement available to you, but it's as I've seen them as high as like 94% filler and 6% active ingredient. You have to give so much more of that cheap product that it's costing you a significant amount more money and you're not getting the same benefits out of it. So ultimately you kind of wasted your money anyway. So look at how much are you going to have to use and how does that apply to the price rather than just saying, okay, I'm just going to go with whatever sticker price seems the most comfortable because you might be doing yourself a disservice by using a sticker price. Wow. I think, I don't know that anybody has ever answered that way before. And that's <laughs> so wonderful. No, really, because um, especially working with, you know, pet parents one-on-one, -on -one, Pricing is like, especially today, pricing is an issue and I get it. Like I'm right there with everybody else. Mm -hmm. um, pricing mm -hmm. is certainly an issue, but also the quality of the product makes such a huge difference. I have so many people that are giving so many supplements and I'm like, mm -hmm. Please, we've got to stop. We have got to stop, you know, and, and some people have a hard time with that. Some people are like, but no, but no. And I'm like, no, we're going to, we're just, we're going to pull all of this back. Mm -hmm. We're going to you know, find a handful of things that are going to make the biggest impact for mm -hmm. your pet. And like, I know that's really, really hard, especially when, you know, you've been using something for so long and you, you, I don't know. It's just, ah, it drives me, it drives me crazy sometimes how attached people are to brands and products that don't even know who they are. <laughs> And this is where something like Parsley Pet can bring a lot of value. If you're afraid to stop certain supplements, then take a look at the data from your pet's actual body or your body and say, what is my body saying that I do and don't need? And then you can strip away the things that you can see from the body's tissue are not helping and you can add in things that you can see that the body is saying that it needs. It's a much easier way to filter through without it having that emotional aspect to it. Mm -hmm. For, yes, that's one of the reasons why I like testing so much um, is because it's like right there in black and white. This is working. This isn't working. Mm -hmm. um, and I do hope people, well, I'd hope people go check out solutions. I, I, have included it in my rotation and um i really hope people check out parsley pet too because um getting this information on our pets really is like you've said it so many times already it is so valuable to us to be able to better take care of um these tiny little beings that are mm -hmm. our responsibility <laughs> so um, I thank you so much for all of your knowledge um, and sharing it with our listeners. And where can people find all of these wonderful products? Um, There's that's a long list <laughs> um, to abbreviate it. Uh, HeroesPets.com is my retail store. Uh, we're in the process of redoing the website. So you can always reach out with questions and we can direct you to things that we have available or suggest in your area if that's what comes up. Um, solutionspetproducts.com. We don't sell direct. We sell through uh, retailers. And then we have a couple of people that do direct to consumer, but you can reach out if you have questions. And then parsleypet.com. That one's pretty easy to use. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> um, I'll make sure all of that are uh, in the show notes as well. And again, Chelsea, thank you so much for being here. Um, guys, have a fabulous rest of your week and please give your pets some extra love from both me and Chelsea this week.